Platt with Liberty and Me, here with James Padiglione and Sarah Squire, who are about to give a really interesting talk on uh, art and liberty. It's entitled, No Liberty, No Art, No Art, No Liberty. Great title. So I just wanted to know, you know, you, you all deal with some really interesting topics as far as, um, you know, bringing outside some aesthetics and things into the liberty movement, things that aren't spoken about enough. And I, I wanted to ask both of you, you know, what is, where is that intersectionality in art and liberty? And how, how does one influence the other? How does, uh, how does the other influence uh, the one? Um, this is a good question. We were talking right before we started filming about some student protests. Um, and I think a, a good place to look for the intersectionality of, of art and liberty is in protest movements and in protest art. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the street artist Banksy. Um, and some of the ways that he has used his street art to express discontent with the massive growth of the surveillance state in England, um, I think is very important. So art on that level, I think, can be an incredibly important proponent for liberty. Absolutely. Yeah, I've always, you know, I, th I think of art as creation and art as kind of demanding innovation, you know, art forces or kind of ass of the artists to be original and to to be creative and all those ideas creativity innovation spontaneity emergence a lot of that for me is that's my libertarianism right there it is living creatively and innovatively and so there's no better way to see the creation and the innovation of humanity than through art because you can create worlds that don't actually exist yet or never will through art in lots of different ways it's also a way to give us access to the voice of the individual, which I think is enormously important for the liberty movement. We have so many stories about liberty, about our own lived experience, about the experiences of friends and people who are dear to us, about the experiences of people who we've never met. And we need to be able to convey those stories in ways that are going to be persuasive and filled with emotional content in order to put the human beings inside the discussion of liberty. And art is a great way to do that. It lets us hear those voices. It lets us see those people. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, one could argue, I guess, that fiction does more to solve the Hayekian knowledge problem than just about anything else. I have to think about that one. Does I don't know if it solves it. it. I don't know if you can ever solve the knowledge problem, yeah. but it gets more perspectives or it shows you more knowledge that you may not have access to personally. I know Martha Nussbaum is a political philosopher, but she talks about literature being a way for you to understand what other people's lives are like, the knowledge that other people have that you may not necessarily have just because you live two different kinds of lives. You can read a story and identify with characters. Think Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, It's a book where majority middle upper middle class white women were reading this book and being able to identify with Eliza who's a slave mother and they might not ever have seen themselves as being the same as an African American woman if it wasn't through that novel and identifying mother to mother with it so that's fantastic when three o'clock oh what time is it sounds like we're done oh. <laughs> well I have to come back to it can we find somewhere else really quickly <laughs> Another question would be, uh, you know, do you think that the freedom to express art in an area is an effective metric to measure the freedom in that area? Because, you know, an example, of course, that's close to us is, you know, the United States, where generally I feel like people have a lot of freedom to express themselves through art. But, you know, there are a lot of areas where we're limited on freedom, of course, not compared to other places. But I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? I, that's a really interesting question, Kyle. One of the things that I hear a lot of people say is that actually oppression produces more and better art. Um, they argue about the incredible writing that's coming out of, say, the, the Soviet Union um, in protest against the state. They argue about the Renaissance, right, which did not exactly have a free society um, in, in most places. And the, but we know there's an enormous boom in painting and in writing and in music at the same time. And so they suggest that what you really need for good art is government oppression to struggle against. Um, I tend to think that that's nonsense. Um, certainly you get good art under 
um, under government oppression. But I don't think you get more art. I don't think you necessarily get better art. And when you get state oppression, the artists are always the people, or almost always the people, whose heads are on the block first. Sure. sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> one of my favorite things that Anthony Gregory ever told me was that if you're reading a novel and enjoying it, it was written by someone, it probably was written by someone who doesn't understand economics. And that, I don't know, that kind of reminds, I know, it's, it's just kind of silly, but I don't know, it really makes you think about that whole idea that, that art is better under oppressed societies because, you know, when you look at stuff that came out of the Soviet Union, it's, I don't know, maybe freedom isn't the best thing for the artist because they're not under that kind of struggle. Well, Keats, um, who's an English romantic poet, wrote a great sonnet called On the English Sonnet. The argument of which is that if you have to follow rules for a poem, as you do when writing a sonnet, it's a very rule-bound form, um, if you have to follow rules when you're writing a poem, they ought to be the rules that you choose for yourself. Now that doesn't sound to me like state oppression. That doesn't sound to me like the heavy hand of the state telling you what you can write and what you can't write. That sounds to me much more like a Hayekian spontaneous order framework where the rules evolve and are in place in order to allow for the most effective operating of the order that has evolved. That to me is the kind of order under which art can flourish. You're going to get art and you're always going to get protest art if you have the heavy hand of the state, but I don't think that means that if we want art we should impose the heavy yeah, hand of the never, state. Yeah, I, you know, can I be existentialist for a second here? No. Well, I guess absurdist because I'm going to quote Camus, but Camus I think says the artist is free at the moment he wants to be and I think what you're saying is absolutely right. You have these conventions that govern art like forms and aesthetics. I mean, there's form, there's formalism in some of this. Music has forms, poetry has a form. But I think like just, I know with my research in jazz and in other, you know, Dada and Cubism, there's an idea that like the artist has to liberate themselves from the fear of being holding back even, right? So this the, the freedom of the artist is sometimes just on a personal level. Are you oppressing your own free expression? write what you want to write and put your whole heart into it or put your whole heart into your music composition and like that kind of freedom I don't that has nothing to do with what's happening outside your studio or whatever that that is the artist free to make and that is really true individual freedom the true expression of whatever you want to express or put into song or music I'm I'm thinking of Toni Morrison who finds her liberation in making books that resonate with her life experiences and characters that are that look and sound like people she knew growing up and like for her that's a place of freedom to write a book about what would normally be marginal not important subjects sure sure do you think there's a kind of cognitive dissonance that occurs with artists and with patrons of the art as far as support for for politicians and for governments I, you know i think about you know actors and actresses on the show like um, House of Cards, which obviously depicts politics, I would argue, realistically, um, as, you know, murderous, awful slime. But, you know, you've got these individuals... Words. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you've got these individuals, these actors on the show and actresses who, you know, will donate to campaigns and support politicians. So, you know... Oh, and, and also, yeah, the, the Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde, who said that the, the greatest government for the artist is no government at all but also had socialistic tendencies you know i wonder if if that there's that kind of cognitive dissonance what it do they don't know squire's law they don't know squire's law that's all <laughs> does everyone squire's law is the best she, what, what, what? squire's law is that all politicians are asshats well obviously yeah so that, that's, that's the law not, not not that it's not a great law but yeah that's that's it's very simple but i, I think i'm not so sure it's a cognitive dissonance and i think that that I think that it's important when you're talking about art to be able to separate the life of the artist from the work of art that is created. Um, 1984 is written by a socialist. It just is. It's one of the best arguments that we have against the surveillance state, against totalitarianism. It's spectacular. If we were to reject that on the grounds that it was written by a socialist, we'd be idiots. We would be absolute fools. What we need to do when faced with what looks like cognitive dissonance 
in between the the work of art that is produced and the political beliefs of the people who produced it. We need to look and we need to say why does someone who produces 1984 hang on to socialism? Why is it that someone who's involved with House of Cards can still think and have a lot of faith in the political process, right? So what is happening there with the way that we as people who love liberty are getting across our message and are doing the work that we're doing that is not conveying to them that there might be a problem here between the art that they're making and the things for which they are voting or the things which they are choosing to fund. So I think we need to turn it back on ourselves rather than whining about artists and actors. It's tough to do. That's why it doesn't happen often. <laughs> well, you know, this is, you could do some interesting work in public choice theory and looking at how art funding really the public choice incentives behind when the state gets involved in even art creation do not always lend themselves well to even some of these artists. If I think they're just, people are not used to thinking about all aspects of the government and how it works incentive wise. So they may not see it in the same way that a libertarian would approach the situation. But just a little explanation as like follow the money kind of things. I, I feel like some of that, it's not so much, it's cognitive, it's not so much cognitive dis dissonance as it is just not being as critical about every aspect of where the government is being incentivized to work in different ways and how that really does impact the artists, especially through IP and that kind, you know, I know IP, property, and, uh, intellectual property, I see I don't even, I don't, I don't believe in it so I don't even know what it is, right? <laughs> intellectual property and music copyright and these kinds of things are getting in the way of artists who are trying to break in and artists who are trying to get their craft out and you get a monopoly of art even. So there are lots of reasons for artists to not be so blindly supportive of the state. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Sarah Squire and James Padiglione, doing some of, without a doubt, the most interesting work in the libertarian movement. Thanks so much.